you, Brother Welby. You'll find our text this morning in the book of Proverbs. You can know where Brother Job is. Some folks call him Job, and then they get saved, and they know his name is Job. What a wonderful Sunday school lesson this morning from Job. And then you find the song, you're getting close. And then right behind that is Proverbs. Our text is in Proverbs chapter 22. We're going to be looking at verse number 28. In Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 28. The Bible said, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. And then if you look across to chapter number 23, we have the verse repeated. Remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless. We're going to use this as our text this morning. I want to preach to you on this subject. Preserve the landmark. We live in the most dangerous day of modern history. The reason is that the three landmarks that God established, we have forsaken. If you lived as I did a long time ago, you would see that the family, the home, is not the same. Well, we have good homes around Calvary, and I was witnessing to some folks this week, and, and the gentleman was a guy about as old as me, the one in the group, and uh, he was telling how things have changed. Well. They have changed. Young people, if you'll pay close attention to me, it's like the story of the fellow that put the frog in room temperature water. And then it's a very crude story. He boiled it, and the frog swam until he was killed. That's what's happening in our society today. Our homes are being destroyed. The old fashioned home with the family altar is all but gone. And I don't believe it is at Calvary. I believe we have some holy homes, some godly homes. But when God stepped out of nowhere, stood on nothing and spoke this world into existence, he took the dirt of the earth and he formed a man. When that man was formed, he had lungs and arteries and nose and eyeballs and ears just like you and I. He looked just like us, uh, maybe a little more handsome than some of us. But uh, God did something then. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Amen. And he became a living soul that will never die. Now, I don't think you can put it in the grave. You've heard me say it sometime that if you put the soul of man in, the, in a grave, he burst out. The grave couldn't hold him. Well, God made him a living soul. And he had made all the other creation. The dogs and cats, the camels, the donkeys and so forth. And he made the male and female, but he only made the man male. He made the man to fellowship with. God was created. You were born to fellowship with God. To have fellowship with the Lord, we come to him in prayer, we read his word, he speaks to us, we speak to him in prayer, and he fellowships with us. I want to be closer to the Lord today than I have since the first days of my conversion. I say to the Lord often as I read the word, thank you for your holy word, Lord, I want to live real close to you. And I feel the temptation of Satan stronger today than I ever have in my Christian life. Some of you can say the same thing. Now God created a woman, he brought her to the man. Adam named her Eve. And then we learn of the fall. And we do not know how long a time it was. But Eve influenced Adam to fall. Adam made a decision that he loved Eve more than he did God. 
You can say whatever you want. You can study it any way you want to, but you cannot improve on that, nor can you disprove that. Made the decision that he would rather walk in sin, knowing right from wrong with Eve, than he would want to walk in holiness. And then God created the family. And he created a family like this. Created a family, created a home. The father is the head. The wife is the helper. The Bible said it's not good for a man to live alone. He needs a helper. And then he gave them children. Someone asked me this morning about Cain and Abel. Uh, why, uh, something about why was uh, Cain's offering not acceptable? Did Cain know? Well, Cain knew there was to be a blood sacrifice because God offered the first blood sacrifice to himself in the Garden of Eden when he skinned the animals and slab them in Eve once a year and then for the particular offering, uh, frequent offering. The father was the priest of the home. Adam was the priest of this home, and uh, he, uh, he made the offering uh, for his family. And God established it there, and so when uh, Cain and Abel brought their offering, uh, they knew that it was to be a blood offering. Now, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5, I want you to look at the Word of God. I'd like you to know... Uh, when I preach, that I'm preaching from the Word of God. I like to have it open before you, and I'll try not to give you so many that it becomes burdensome to turn. But God established the family in the Garden of Eden. He established the blood sacrifice in the Garden of Eden. It was looking forward to the cross of Calvary where Jesus would be crucified. I was there last February. I preached at Gethsemane. What a great, great service it was. How the power of God poured forth on that Lord's Day morning. With my back to the eastern gate. And my faith, my face looking at Mount Calvary. Or looking at the mouth there of Gethsemane. At the Mount of Olives. And God got into things and people really rejoiced and had a great time in the Lord. And may I say to you, from that moment to this, Satan has really made an attack. And there's great victory. Look out there, the attack. But then, Dr. Tim Green, my dear friend, preached at Calvary. And then one of the things he said is, and I'll probably repeat it this morning, where there's no conviction, there's no conversion. I want you to keep that in your mind. See people come forward, little children come, mom and dad talk them into it, and they, they come and say the words. But if there's no conviction, there's no conversion. Now in Ephesians chapter five, we're gonna find verse number 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband. Do you have that mechanical pencil I gave you? Underline old. You're not submission to the children. You and your children become adults. They like to boss you around. That's not in submission to the boss where you work. Almost all wives work outside the home today. No, no one is to take the place of the husband. He's in charge, and no woman will ever be happy rebelling against her husband. Up against his authority. And I'm as unto the Lord. Did you get it? Are you submissive unto the Lord? You treat your husband. You revere him. You know Sarah loved her husband and called him Lord. I don't think you ought to do that, but I think you ought to revere your husband. Uh, if he doesn't like for you to dress in a certain way, you ought to dress like he wants. Unless it's sinful. If he's a godly man and he wants to do something in the home, you ought to be submissive. If he says to you, you ought to be on time for church, and you ought to be at Sunday school, then you need to obey your husband. And no woman will ever be blessed of God and be content 
until she loves the Lord supremely and her husband second and her children third. Mm -hmm. Got it? Mm -hmm. Got it? We'll move on. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. You'll notice small c, ecclesia, means the local church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband in everything. You see, a lot of times, wives agree and they say, well, I do what he wants because well, that's because you agree with it. But what if he tells you to do something that's holy, that's righteous, but you don't like doing it? You do that anyway. Then we see that uh, the father is to be, not to be a tyrant, but to lead by absolute and consistent Bible teaching. Notice what the Bible says about the husband. Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Gentlemen, that's a, that's a big order. I was married to Dolores 56 years, a month and 10 days. We never had an argument about who was the head of the home. We had a happy home. And then that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water of the word. I was at Calvary. It became so commercial. At one time, you could still see the mountain real well. Now you can see it. Uh, you can see uh, where the cross was placed. And, and off over here, you can see the empty tomb. But it's not as it was one time. It's all commercialized now. But there Jesus paid the price. Listen to me, beloved. He paid the price for your sin. Good. We sing a song around Calvary. Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? If you're not, you're not saved. You must have faith in Jesus Christ mm -hmm. as Lord and Savior. Now, that he might presented to himself a glorious church, still talking about small c here, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. Uh, beloved, that's what a wife should be. That's what a husband should be. Holy without blemish. We studied about Mr. Job this morning, and he was a holy and a righteous man. You know what to be like Job? It seems in my personal life, I want to be more holy today than I did yesterday. And when I slip, it gets so disgusting. It just, it just makes me ashamed because almost always when you slip, you include someone else. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife, loveth himself. For no man ever gave pain of his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. And then if you would notice, the Father is responsible to God, to the family. Look at me, please. Every man Every young man in this assembly needs to remember this. Every man in the home is responsible to lead the family in holy, righteous living. And that must include a family altar. Now many homes have actual altars where they kneel. I never had one in my home. Usually we gathered around the table. Your pastor does that in his home. I eat a lot of meals there. And he'll say, uh, well, what did you learn in Sunday school this morning? Does anyone have a special verse? And then we'll take the Bible and we'll begin to pray. So uh, the father is responsible to God, to the family. The wife is responsible to the husband. And answer 
the God of salvation. May that mean that you are a bold man. It means you love God supremely and don't disobey him. And that means you're in submission to your husband. And husband, that means you lead your wife and children, your family, in holy living. I remember as a young boy that uh, my dad bought these two farms, 40-acre farms were common in that day, and farms of horses and mules. And I remember my dad taking me as a little boy, I must have been about five or six, and he said, son, I want to show you the landmark. And he took me back to the southwest corner of the farm. And he said, now that stone there, it's a large stone, a round stone. He said, don't ever remove that landmark. Now some have been removed, but my dad taught me. When my son John, your pastor, was a young boy, I said, I want to take you and show you something. We still own the family farm. And I want to show you something, son. See that rock there? Yeah, it's just a rock. No, no, no. That's a special rock. That's the landmark. All the other farms around here go off that landmark. Uh, oh, there's other smaller stones and corners and, and corner folks and all to establish why. But God says in his holy word, don't remove the landmark. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, don't remove the landmark of the Christian family. Don't remove it. It's been, it has been removed today. I was shocked the other day, and I've heard it three times, so I guess it's true, that more black babies are killed in the mother's womb that get, that the mother, than the mother gives birth to Beloved, doesn't that shock you? I don't think you're as shocked as I am. And many others of other colors. But black babies, uh, more than one out of two are killed in the mother's womb. What a tragedy. Children are to obey the Lord. This is a commandment with promise. And then we notice that uh, the second thing God established. You see, when man came out of the Garden of Eden, and Eden and coming out of the Garden of Eden, we were under the dispensation of conscience. That failed. Adam failed, his children failed. And the first sacrifice that's mentioned was Cain and Abel. And Cain said, Look at the fine grain I got here. I'll give God the first bushel. That isn't what God asked for. He asked for a blood sacrifice. And every time the blood sacrifice was offered, it pointed to Calvary. I can't tell you what it did to me to stand at Calvary. I got as close as I could, and it did something for me. And then I walked down the trail and I looked at the empty tomb. I can't tell you what it did to me to look at the empty tomb. I looked at the stone that was rolled away. The tomb was not like I expected. It had a small hole. You see, when they put the body in there, they didn't need a big hole. They would drag it in and put it over there. When it decayed, they'd scrape the bones off, put them in a box. And then they put another body there. They did, did not do that in Jesus, that tomb. And I looked at it. When I went to Nazareth, and I walked there in Nazareth, and the sign said it was the same stone as the day Jesus was there. Beloved, it did something to me. Uh, there was something special about walking where Jesus walked. Now, I had a lot of ideas about what the Bible had was, but none of them were accurate. Well, when man failed in conscience, God established 
government, government by man, and uh, laws based upon the word of God, enforced by God-fearing people. When America was founded, we broke with England, where they had state church. Uh, you were a religious person. Uh, you had drops of water placed on your head. And it was established that you were part of the Church of England. Well, a lot of those wet-headed babies died and went to hell. And we said, that's not right. And our forefathers said, we want a Bible. We want to preserve the landmark of the family. We want to preserve the landmark of church, uh, of the uh, our church, the government. And we want to establish it by the word of God. You know, our past president said, uh, and I heard him, they said it second hand. He said, I think we need uh, to update our constitution. No, no, no. A thousand times no. Don't remove the landmark of our constitution. Boy, then it's not the word of God, but it's based on the word of God. Those men that weren't saved believed the Bible and it was established on the word of God. Thou shalt not. Now there's great controversy uh, over capital punishment. Uh, some believe in it, some don't. But what does the Bible say? You see, we are not to commit murder. But God is to control. There are some crimes that God says require uh, death. And then the third thing is the church, the ecclesia. If you have not turned your Bible to Ephesians 5, please do. The church, the ecclesia, is the Greek word. Local call now assembly of baptized believers. A uh, pastor was talking to someone in my presence, and they said, well, uh, we got baptized, we were a part of another church, but they didn't have a baptistry, and I was baptized at Calvary, and I wonder if you have a record of it. Here's what your pastor properly said. No, you see, you were baptized into the membership, and they keep the record. Someone said, I heard them on the television this morning, you ought to be saved, repent and be converted, you need to be saved, and then you need to join the church. Beloved, that's not true. What is true is you need to repent and be converted. And when you're baptized, you're baptized into the membership of the church. That's why that those uh, came to us from the Methodist church or the Episcopalian, wherever you came from. And you said, well, I, I got saved and I got baptized. Now I want to join Calvary. We don't accept at Calvary. We're historical Baptists. We don't accept what they call foreign. I call other baptism. For one thing, they don't have any authority to baptize. Sure. Who God give the authority to? You study your Bible and you'll be a Baptist. Amen. I remember my first sermon. I preached my first sermon as a green young Christian. And my pastor did what all young, all preachers do to young preachers. You remember the story about the persimmon? Every daddy wants his boy to have a persimmon that's green. I don't know why we mean an ombre like that, but we are. And every preacher wants his preacher boy to preach his first sermon, green as grass. And I was reading my Bible. I was reading it every day. I was reading volumes every day. And I read that Jesus was baptized by Baptist. Say amen. If you don't agree, say only. <coughs> and so then I noticed that all the apostles were baptized by Baptist. His name was John. Now, you'd think ever Baptist would have a boy named John. John the Baptist. And so I was preaching, stumbling and blubbering. 
He has really set me up. Showed me that you can't preach without the power of God. Taught me that you don't get saved, surrender to preach, jump off on a stump and start hollering and say, just preaching. One fellow down south told me, when God saves you, he'll fill your mouth. He said, yeah, so it was hot, hot air. And so I preached and I said this, I am a Baptist because Jesus was a Baptist. Amen. People were sucking air all over the building. I still say, I am a Baptist because Jesus was a Baptist. Yeah. Jesus didn't need to be baptized. He did it as an example to you and I. Amen. Amen. I don't believe only Baptists go to heaven. But I believe Baptists will receive a reward for being Baptists when they get to heaven. I believe there will be rewards to those who've been baptized as a Baptist, because all you have to do is read your Bible to know that's the right thing to do. Now, the pastor doesn't let me preach often, and he's not going to let me preach again, so I'm going to pour it on the bottom. <laughs> the head of the church is Christ. Look at verse number 25. He's still got. 23, I'm sorry, of uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse number 23. For as the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. You just have that little mechanical pencil I gave you? There's your little, little line under that. And then you'll remember later, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior, of the body. The reason that I'm not part of a denominational church is they have hierarchy and they have committees and they have boards and they have governing people and uh, they don't give Christ the Lordship. I was in Brazil walking through some of those old Catholic churches and I was noticing that people would go up and they bow here by uh, one of those statues. And then they go to the next one and they bow and they mutter some stuff. And then they go to, and then the lines of them up each side, all statues, appeared to me to be uh, life size or even as high, eight feet high. And I said to our uh, missionary guide, uh, oh, what are they doing? What are they muttering? He said, they're praying to those saints. And some of their bones are probably buried in this building. And they're praying to them. Uh, I heard some folks recently praying to Mary. Are you aware of this, my dear friend? Mary had to get saved the same way you did. That's right. I heard them say, Hail Mary, Mother of Grace, pray for us sinners, especially in our hour of need. I heard the fellow that did that movie you all looked at and I wouldn't I don't know if you all did but I'm sure as I'm standing here some of you did I heard him say oh I think people will be saved if they'll pray to Mary to get saved Mary couldn't save herself and Mary didn't need your insult by praying to her right. she didn't want to be prayed to and so Christ is a, he's the head of the church and then the church as an overseer, I want you to turn to 1 Timothy, chapter number 3. 1 Timothy, chapter number 3. Paul wrote these two epistles to Timothy from prison. And in 1 Timothy, he's giving him instruction. And in 1 Timothy, chapter 3, he tells about the overseer at the church. Preserve the landmarks, young people. Preserve the landmarks, old people. Preserve the landmarks. Everyone in between. Now notice, if you would please, in verse number one of chapter three of First Timothy, this is through Satan. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now, God calls the bishops. That's the pastor. 
God calls them, they're God called, but they have to have a desire in their heart to serve him. A patient man must be blameless, a husband or one wife, vigilant, sober, and good behavior. Given the hospitality, apt to teach. He better be apt to teach, because he's going to have to teach the book. Not given to wine and danger, not a loser, no striker, not greedy or filthy looker, but patient. Not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gratitude. Preacher's children better be minding, or they disqualify him. For a man, or if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, he's not a new convert, lest being lifted up with pride, he shall fall into condemnation of the devil. A lot of folks there, my friend. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. In his community, they better not say he's a crook. Lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Now, the overseer of the church is the pastor. God will give you wisdom. Give your pastor wisdom about your problem. He'll give your pastor wisdom to preach that he won't give to you. He's the overseer. We call him the under-shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd. He is the under-shepherd. Now notice all in verse number 8, the deacons. There are two. Remove not the ancient landmark. There are two offices specified in, in the Bible. Pastor, bishop, deacon. The deacon has like requirements. Now notice what he says. Likewise, verse number eight, must the deacons be brave. That means they're sincere. Not double tongue. Now, if we were reading from the Greek text, I might have said they're two faced. But this is the best translation. Not given to much wine, they're not losers. Not given to filthy lucre. The love of money is the root of all evil. Holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. You see your pastor hold the Bible up to. Say, this is the breath of God. He has a good conscience. The deacon ought to be able to hold that Bible up. Say, this is the very breath of God. When I retired a couple years ago, I left Pastor John Riker with two good deacons. When I inherited this years ago, I think I had seven or nine and maybe 11 qualified. You see, the church used to have this philosophy. If a person comes and, and comes frequently, comes regular, uh, give them an office so that they stay. Beloved, how much bigger an error can be made? Holding the mystery of faith and a pure conscience. Let these also first be proved, not a novice, be proved, and let them use the office of the deacon being found blameless. Even so, must their wives be great. Did you notice that there's a requirement of the deacon that's not mentioned for the pastor? But it says up here likewise, not slanders, they're not gossips, they're not tale bearers, they're not criticizers. Sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife. Ruling their children and their own house as well. Listen to me, listen to me. Children, grandchildren. If you're disobedient and you're a deacon's child, you are destroying that deacon's ministry. Can I say it one more time? When you feel like being mean, you remember your daddy's a pastor. You remember your daddy's a deacon. 
and don't destroy their ministry. Amen. This, this building should have rang with amens. But the deacons need the husband to one wife ruling their children in their own house as well. Spare the rod, spoil the child. I know deacons whose ministries have been destroyed by the children. I knew a deacon who had a rebellious son that God killed. And he said, I want to crawl in that casket with him. You see, that's why the boy is disobedient. He was not brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But the daddy, I think he was killed or carnal, the wreck and either drunk or on drugs. The daddy said, well, he's just a saved young man. Really? You know, I don't like these funerals where preachers preach people into heaven. So they have used the office of deacon, well purchased to themselves a good degree, and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Then if you turn your Bibles to the book of Acts, the book of Acts, Chapter number two, the book of Acts. Chapter number two. In Acts chapter two. We're going to be reading verses 41 to 47. Acts chapter two, verses 41 to 47. You see, Preserve the landmarks, the family, the home, the family, the government, and the local church. And here's the membership that makes up the local church. The membership of the local Baptist church is made up of baptized, saved, baptized members. Once in a while, somebody will sneak in for some deception or something, but that's, that's how you join the Baptist church is by baptism. Now, verse number 41, chapter 2, the membership. And they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them 3,000 souls. Would you look down to verse 47? Praising God and having the favor with all the people of the Lord added to the church. Daily, such as should be saved. My beloved, the Baptist Church is made up of baptized members. Some of you, maybe you're not saved. And baptism is just getting wet. This morning, God has given you another opportunity to be a part of these three entities that he established. And landmarks that should not be moved. The home and family, government, and the local church. And today Jesus stands and says, Come unto me, or that labor or heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Some more to say, Well, I. Uh, I'll wait for another time. You may not have another time. Somebody said, well, I kind of believe I'm saved. That's probably a sure instance, a sure evidence that you're not saved. Right. So in a minute, we're going to sing a verse of invitation. We're going to give you an opportunity to get your homes in order. For wives to say, I'm going to be a submissive wife. Husbands to say, I'm going to be the head of my home. But for the unsaved to say, Brother Riker, I want to be saved. Someone said, well, I made a profession when I was a child. Did you get saved? God wants to save you much more than you want to be saved. With her head bowed, her eyes closed, or looking around, out of curiosity.